start my talk about the COVID-19 and liver disease at the crossroads. Uh, the agenda of our meeting today, we need to address two important points. Firstly, why it's important to discuss the consequences of COVID-19 on the liver disease patients. And the second point is about how to follow the patients with an underlying liver disease during the pandemic of COVID-19. Firstly, we need to talk about why to talk about the consequences of COVID-19 on the liver diseases. We need to highlight the uh, COVID-19, uh, if it causes uh, liver damage or no, uh, and whether the people with, with hepatitis B or hepatitis C are at increased risk for getting COVID-19 or having severe COVID-19 disease. And if the patients with liver cirrhosis and hepatic cellular carcinoma at higher risk for severe COVID-19 than general population. Regarding the uh, COVID-19 induced liver damage, we can say in numbers that uh, the elevated liver uh, biochemistry is a common presentation of the COVID-19 infection. It was reported in about 14 to 76 percent of the patients, and the elevated transaminases, and usually the AST more elevated than ALT, uh, was the most commonly reported pattern of liver injury. Uh, also, slight elevation of the bilirubin was reported in about 10 percent of the cases. This the gamma GT was reported in about 50 percent of the cases, but with usually uh, alk uh, normal alkaline to cities normal range. So the uh, re uh, commonly reported uh, situation is that we have trans uh, elevated transaminases, but less than three falls the upper limit normal. So when we have the elevation more than three to five folds the upper limit normal, or the elevation of the bilirubin more than three folds the upper limit normal, we need to think about other causes of uh, liver injury like septicemia, cytokine effect hypoxic liver injury and the ventilator complication and the drug-related uh, injuries, especially with the experimental uh, therapy used for the COVID-19 nowadays. And we need to keep in mind that having low platelets, low albumin or prolonged INR usually carry a bad prognosis regarding the morbidity and mortality for the COVID-19 patients. So uh, when we come uh, to say surprisingly, we find that the, the cholestatic liver disease is not the common feature of the COVID-19 disease, but regarding the pathogenesis and the pathophysiology uh, about the uh, SARS-CoV-2 induced cytopathic effect, you can find that uh, the SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2 viruses bind to the ACE2, the angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptors, which are commonly uh, found on the cholangiocytes rather than the, the hepatocytes. And the most important biopsies for the patients with COVID-19 disease uh, showed moderate microvascular cytosis, mild lobular and portal activity, but no reported fibrosis or fibrin deposits, uh, which uh, indicative of injury either from the SARS-CoV-2 infection or from the used medications. So we can say that the cause of liver injury usually in uh, the setting of the COVID-19 infection is a multifactorial element. Uh, we have the previously listed causes and in this uh, review article was prepared by our colleague, Professor Sharif Musa, he is working in my center also. Uh, he has addressed also the hepatic congestion due to the high level of positive index respiratory pressure and the uh, associated myositis are the common causes for the elevated liver enzymes in the patients who are presenting with SARS-CoV-2 infection or COVID-19 disease. But I need to say, don't feel very safe because it is already reported. This is a case report in the American Journal of Gastroenterology talking about COVID-19 presenting with an acute hepatitis. Uh, it was presented by Valkyrin, elevated transaminases and low albumin raised the ferritin. It was reported in a patient with HIV infection on therapy, and uh, his viral screening was negative, and previous test was normal, so it was indicative of uh, acute hepatitis uh, induced by SARS-CoV-2 infection or COVID-19 disease. The second point is about uh, to uh, say why you are talking about the consequences of uh, liver uh, diseases on uh, of the COVID-19 or liver disease. It's about uh, whether the people with hepatitis B or C infection are at increased risk for getting uh, COVID-19 or having more severe disease. And at this point, we can say that globally, these patients are not at increased risk for acquiring infection, but uh, the patients with chronic liver disease usually at higher risk for the comorbid complications, likely the elderly patients and the other patients with comorbidities or the patients who are receiving immunosuppressive therapy or diseases like autoimmune hepatitis or 
post transplantation. And currently, we have little evidence about the contribution of the chronic viral hepatitis and chronic hepatitis B or chronic hepatitis C uh, to the severity and overall outcome in the SARS CoV 2 infection. But in this study, uh, it was done in about uh, 1,000 patients and it was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It was talking that 2.1% uh, of the old cohort had confirmed the hepatitis B infection, and the severe cases were more likely to have hepatitis B infection rather than the non-severe cases, about 2.4 versus 0.6%. Also, regarding the hepatitis C in the study, which was published in 2003, uh, it was addressing that SARS patients uh, with hepatitis B or C infection were more prone to develop severe hepatitis, and probably due to uh, this was probably due to the enhanced viral replication during the SARS-CoV infection. And uh, see, we have now some evidence that uh, the medications for hepatitis C and hepatitis B, like sofibuvir, tenofovir, ribavirin, may have some potential therapeutic activity against SARS-CoV-2 infection, and a lot of uh, trials are uh, underway now. So that's why the topic of COVID-19 and the pre-existing viral hepatitis related chronic liver disease, in addition to the potential role of direct acting antiviral, will be discussed by Professor Gamal Asmat in the coming talk, inshallah. <clears throat> also, we need to say uh, if the patients with hepatocellular carcinoma at higher risk for severe COVID-19 than the general population, till now we don't have an solid evidence whether the patients with hepatocellular carcinoma uh, are at higher risk for severe disease. But we have one study that uh, saying that the patients with COVID-19 uh, are uh, uh, I'm sorry, the patients with uh, one study reported that uh, there is link between the cancer and worse disease outcome due to the immune dysregulation for these patients. Also, nowadays, we have uh, uh, growing evidence about the importance of anticoagulation and its linking to the COVID-19 survival. And uh, it is now recommended Ahmed, by... Okay. Sure, sure. I'm saying that uh, evidence uh, now is building about the linkage of anticoagulation to COVID-19 uh, survival. And we have a lot of the protocols all over the world saying now or recommending now that all patients with COVID-19 should be placed on prophylactic doses of anticoagulation uh, unless there is contraindication. So we need to ask our, uh, the, 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 the important question, what about the patients with chronic liver disease? Especially that we have an uh, like an uh, old assumption uh, that the patient with uh, liver cirrhosis has an uh, auto anticoagulation uh, or is is auto anticoagulated, but now all the evidence uh, is uh, contradictory to this uh, point, and the patient with compensated liver cirrhosis may be actually at higher risk for thrombotic rather than having hemorrhagic complications. That's why they may benefit from the anticoagulation, either it's prophylactic or it's therapeutic, uh, but we need to think about the screening for viruses and the risk of uh, variceal bleeding in such patients. The second part of our meeting today, it will be about how to follow the patients with an underlying liver disease during the, the pandemic of, of, of COVID-19 disease. Regarding the patients with compensated liver cirrhosis, we can say uh, that uh, we need to uh, rely more on the telemedicine, we may need to delay the HC surveillance to postpone the baricell screening. And for the decompensated patients, we need to uh, stress on the prophylactic uh, measures like vaccination for the influenza and the pneumocyst uh, and the strep pneumonia, uh, the prophylaxis for SPD and encephalopathy. And we need to include the COVID-19 testing for the patients with acute decompensation. And regarding the patients with hepatocellular carcinoma and liver transplantation, we have the uh, third talk today by Professor Douglas Duprick. He will talk about the COVID-19 and the HCC, including a discussion of its effect on the liver transplantation as a key therapy for the hepatocellular carcinoma. And the last point, it's about the endoscopy and the procedures. Also, the talk by Professor Kelly Brock, it will be about the management of viruses, of viruses during the COVID-19, including key points on the proper usage of the uh, protective equipment during the endoscopy. So uh, I have finished my talk now. I will leave the microphone for Professor Gamal Asmat to start his uh, talk now. Uh, I wish to thank you, Ahmed. And of course, I wish to thank uh, Professor Lebrick and Professor Kelly uh, for their acceptance to be with us uh, today. 
Uh, in fact, as you, all of you know, we are facing a big problem of coronavirus, COVID-19 all over the world. And also we have a big problem here in Egypt with chronic viral hepatitis and chronic liver disease, especially HCV patients. So my talk today will be about this. Next, please. Um, the most important thing that I want to look for it is that, that uh, the COVID, the dysfunction that can happen is due to the direct effect of the virus itself, but this is only if we have severe COVID-19, and also we can have a liver affection from drug hepatotoxicity, or what we call the cytokine storm, the cytokine storm which happens also, and maybe also if we have pneumonia associated with hypoxia, this may lead to affection of the liver with elevation of liver enzymes. Next. Um, there is no evidence that patients with a stable chronic liver disease have an increased susceptibility to infection by, by COVID-19 disease. However, for patients with advanced chronic liver disease, they are at increased risk of infection and mortality because over all of us know about the cirrhosis associated immune dysfunction and this immune dysfunction can lead to more susceptibility to infection and more morbidity of the disease. Next. Also, we have to put in our consideration that we have to change our practice nowadays when following our patients with chronic liver disease. We have to start to look for telemedicine to minimize the exposure for the patients to going to the clinic, to the hospitals. But we are facing a problem here that telemedicine cannot be accepted by many of the uh, laws as a method for examination of patients or prescribing a medication for them. So nowadays, we are what we are making, that we are making telemedicine with another doctor and this doctor is looking for the patients and he is transmitting all his observation to us that we can use this telemedicine in making judgment on the patient himself because we are very afraid that patients with advanced liver cirrhosis when they are transmitted to the clinic or to the hospital and the crowdedness and waiting area so we want to make some new regulation for the telemedicine to help us in evaluating these patients with chronic liver disease. Uh, and I think that also this can, will be discussed during the follow-up of patients with hepatosarcosinoma. Also, we have to delay some of our surveillance, whether for hepatosarcosinoma or variceal screening, we can use non-invasive parameters, but also endoscopy. Also, uh, Dr. Uh, Kelly will talk about this and about vascular carcinoma. Dr. Douglas will also talk about this. So this is a, a, a unique situation that we want to look for what will be the progress for evaluation and also for follow-up of our chronic liver disease patients. Next. When we shift to viral hepatitis, if we have one of our patients receiving treatment for HCV or HBV, of course, he can continue on his medication, especially for uh, treatment for HBV. All of you know that most of our cases are treating for HBV all their, always they didn't stop the treatment. Also HCV, if he is now receiving his course of treatment, he can 
continue in medication. But to start new medications for patients, whether HCV or HBV, it has to be discussed if we can start the treatment with uh, not a close follow-up, like if we have a patient with uh, chronic liver disease uh, due to HCV, he has no decompensation, his liver functions is good. We can give him the medications for the HCV, the antiviral treatment, and follow him maybe after three months, something like that. So in this situation, we can start new treatment, but if you are talking about a patient with advanced liver disease and he need uh, close follow-up and he didn't start treatment for HCV till now, my suggestion is not to start in this era because these patients need uh, a lot of follow-up. He needs more and more visits. He may develop some of the side effects of the drugs, especially if we are talking about ribavirin and anemia and things like that. So if you are talking about a patient with compensated liver disease, you can start for him treatment for HCV. But if he is not compensated or if you have a patient with decompensated liver disease, my suggestion is to postpone until we uh, come over of this situation of the pandemic of COVID-19. Of course, it is not known or it's not recommended to start patients with HCV infection and he has double infection with COVID-19 with HCV, it's not a routinely warranted to start the treatment for this patient. Next. When we go in more details about the relationship between COVID-19 and especially the direct antiviral agents which is used for HCV treatment, we know that next, both the virus are depending on a very important enzyme, the previous slide. They are depending on the, the, a very important uh, enzyme, and this enzyme is sharing in the both viruses. So when we are giving an antiviral treatment for HCV and it suppress the RNA dependent RNA eliminate enzymes. This also can depress and can also affect the COVID-19. Of course, this is very important. Notice that maybe we can use the antiviral treatment, the direct antiviral treatment for HCV as a uh, a, a method for also treating the COVID-19. Next. This is why there is a lot of studies nowadays to bind the, uh, the treatment for COVID with the direct antiviral agents. Of course, it's uh, the affinity of binding is less, but there is also uh, a possible role for sofosbuvir and ribavirin, and also for other drugs that I will discuss from the direct antiviral agents can be, that can be effective for treatment of COVID-19. Next. This is some of the studies by using molecular docking. And molecular docking, this is a very important used method to look for the structure-based drug design. And it is very important for drug development. It looks for the small molecules and look for the binding sites. And also it is important for us to make rationale for designing of drugs. And by this technique, we have one of our colleagues in Cairo University in Faculty of Science, Professor Abdul Fei. He published three papers during the last two months looking for the effect of sofosbuvir, ribavirin, and other uh, direct antiviral agents on the SARS virus and the, the COVID 
virus and we found that it is effective. Next. So also there is a clinical trials using sofosbuvir in combination with velbatazvir in treatment of COVID-19 patients. And all of us know that sofosbuvir is a safe drug. So there is no problem of using sofosbuvir and maybe we can try also to start treatment by sofosbuvir as a prophylactic treatment as we are talking about hydroxychloroquine as a prophylaxis, but we know that hydroxychloroquine have a lot of side effects, but sofosbuvir is very safe. There is a trial for using it now for the treatment, but also there is some thinking of starting trials looking for its role as a prophylaxis for healthcare workers and uh, relatives for patients. But for the ribavirin, the condition is different because we do know that ribavirin is not a safe drug. And if we use the ribavirin in patients with COVID-19, it has to be used cautiously because it may, it may lead to severe hemolytic anemia. And all of us know the problem of coagulopathy and coagulation in patients with COVID-19. Next. Also in China, one of the protease inhibitors which are licensed in China is the Danubrevir. And they did a trial on the use of Danubrevir boosted by Ritonavir. And they found that it is effective and this study was done on China in a good number of patients. This is most of the talk that I want. I, the next slides are the reference. Next. These are some of the reference. But before talking to, to the reference, of course, the most promising uh, drug now is remdesivir. And of course, remdesivir is now having a lot of clinical trial. And we are now in Egypt preparing ourselves to start a clinical trial using also in patients with COVID-19. And also it is effective in uh, blocking of the enzymes which is responsible for the uh, replication of the virus itself. Remedisivir was used before for the treatment of Ebola virus. Nowadays it has some potentiality for treatment of patients with COVID-19. Next. Here are some of the uh, studies that I mentioned about the use of uh, the antiviral drugs and the effect of the COVID-19 on hepatology. Next. I want to look for number seven and eight on the reference. And this is what I was talking about it, the use of the, uh, the technique that I was talking about it by Dr. Abdul Fi'i in looking for the effect of different antiviral agents on COVID-19. Next. Next. At the end, I wish to thank you and I hope that we can meet next September, September 2020, here in Cairo during the Yushid, the United Conference of Hepatology and Infectious Disease and we hope at that time it will be safe to meet, not virtually, but to meet personally with each other. And thank you very much. Okay, now it's proceeding. Okay. So, with just a, after that long introduction, cancer is number five worldwide from HCC, but number two cause of death. Key point on top of that is that the incidence and death rate continues to rise, whereas, as you're well aware in your own experience, many other cancers incident. And it's primarily globally due to hepatitis B and hepatitis C. In fact, every 30 seconds, one person in the world dies from liver cancer. And as you know, with hepatitis B and C as the main causes, it's totally preventable. In fact, the other common causes are preventable too. Alcohol, NAFL D, etc. Now, 80 to 85 percent of the cases are, however, hepatitis B and C. And over 80% of those cases 
are in Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, the Middle East and Eastern Mediterranean, which contain 45% of the total world's population. So it's truly a global issue. Now, just to give you a little comparison from the US, in the US, what is the fastest rising cause of cancer? Lung, breast, colon, liver, prostate? I'm giving you the answer on this one, as you might guess, it's liver cancer. And that's been going on for a long time. And just to give you a comparison, lung cancer between 95 and 2004 went down 13%, colon 12, breast eight, prostate five, liver cancer up 54%. In fact, by 2009, compared to 1991, Americans had a 20% lower risk of dying from cancer. 1991 is when cancer peaked in the U.S. cancer deaths. Colorectal, breast, lung, and prostates had particularly reduced because of increased screening, increased recognition, much better therapies. In contrast, liver and biliary cancers have given the greatest rise in incidence, and right now they're more than threefold up for what they were back in 1991. So in the U.S., it's a major problem, but this is the same problem globally. In China, liver disease is the number three cause of death. In Mongolia, liver cancer is more than twice as high as any other cancer in Mongolia. And of course, you're aware of the cause of HCC in Egypt. And I'm just gonna go to the answer on this one. Number one is hepatitis C, but it's hepatitis B and C particularly dropping off uh, with the great program you have had over there for immunization. But hepatitis C, you're doing a great job of treating too. I wish we were doing a good job of identifying and treating our hepatitis C patients. An increasing problem in Europe or in, in Egypt is turning out to be uh, obesity and NASH, which and diabetes along with alcohol. And those, of course, are increasing problems in the Western world as well, where obesity and NASH in the U.S. is rapidly becoming the number one reason uh, for cirrhosis and transplant. So in Egypt, 80% of the patients with HCC have preceding cirrhosis. So that's a major risk factor in identifying who to think about for HCC and who needs to be regularly screened because with the limit in therapies, which I'll come to, uh, we need to identify it early when we have easier therapies to try and cure patients with. Better yet, prevent, as I know you're working at hard in Egypt, in terms of preventing hepatitis C, preventing hepatitis B, decreasing alcohol use, working on obesity and NASH issues to try and decrease the development of cirrhosis in the first place. But at the moment, cases in Egypt are continuing to rise. So surveillance for HCC in the COVID-19 era, is risk mitigation what's most critical? Always screen for COVID-19 first, prioritize those at increased risk, like those with cirrhosis, high AFP, et cetera. Defer, if possible, until after COVID-19 recovery or all of the above. And I'm just gonna skip the quiz on this one because it's obviously all of the above. So HCC surveillance in the era of COVID-19. Basic surveillance, most places, continues to be ultrasound plus alpha fetoprotein. And I put this in bold because COVID-19 risk must be mitigated as surveillance remains crucial. And this is the first step in suspected HCC before you get into any of the other considerations. And those who test negative for COVID-19, then it can be managed as asymptomatic HCC. But <clears throat> as mentioned already, routine can be deferred for several months, such as in those with chronic cirrhotic hepatitis B, uh, where it's less of a high risk. Note, high percentage of HCC though, in parts of Africa and males without cirrhosis where large tumors may show up by age 20 or 25. And then prioritize patients at increased risk, such as elevated AFP and cirrhosis, and screen them using locally available resources and protocols to limit COVID-19 exposure. Patients with COVID-19, HCC surveillance could be deferred until later as hepatitis C again tends to proceed very slowly if it's small to start with and then manage them as non-COVID-19. But uh, they need to be 
monitored closely. So these are kinds of decisions are pretty critical in an HCC patient. And as I'm sure is done in your major hospitals too, decisions on treatment and a care plan should be done via a multidisciplinary process and deviations from institutional protocols or standard treatment guidelines recorded. Ideally, review of outside x-rays, body imaging, lab, medical records, etc., the telemedicine or phone interview of the patient for review by the committee should be performed before ever meeting with that patient in person at your center. Where available and appropriate telemedicine should be utilized to reduce visits to the healthcare centers. Now, this is a, a huge graph of an ideal ACC management multi uh, discipline meeting, critical in this group, and certainly when you get into smaller hospitals and out into rural areas, many of you will not have access to all of this. But ideally, you want a hepatologist, a medical oncologist, very strong radiology support, both radiology oncologic radiology and radiology interventional. And then you need nurses and pharmacists, and finally, surgeons, transplant surgeons and hepatobiliary surgeons. Now, the key point in showing this busy slide is that many of you will recognize or hopefully identify these patients early in a setting where you don't have all of this. And I'm sure you're already aware of this, but in that setting, you need to work out a way to get them referred to one of the major medical centers where these options are going to be available to the patient. Ideally, treatment should be continued in patients who are already on medical therapy. However, more realistically, for patient visits, appropriate infection risk mitigation principles are to be adhered to and standard PPE applied. And you'll hear this again and again and have heard it already multiple times. If curative therapy can be deferred and disease control or bridging therapy used to allow time for COVID-19 to resolve or improve, very active monitoring needs to be in place and available so as to prevent patients from progressing beyond criteria for curative care, such as transplant, resection, or ablation. So HCC management and risk mitigation strategies. If surgical resection is being considered, and remember that surgery in patients who are already cirrhotic, much less with complications, is usually not a good option because of the underlying severity of the disease and because you leave behind a cirrhotic liver still at risk for developing another uh, HCC nodule, then patients for surgery need to be selected with lower risk for post-op complications. The more com comorbidities they have, the higher the COVID-19 morbidity and mortality with that surgery will be. And you also need an anesthetic capacity and a clean operating therapy uh, theater, I mean, and you need a dedicated non-COVID ICU available for recovery of these patients, which may be prolonged. Better is to consider bridging therapies in absence of the above being available. Similar issues to, whoops, sorry. Similar issues to surgical resection and tra transplant uh, anesthetic availability, ICU availability, potential COVID-19 risk of immunosuppression, et cetera, from the transplant need to be considered. And this gets back to your multidisciplinary team with a wide variety of members. And not on that list, but I would add to it in the COVID-19 period is a specialist in infectious diseases because of the various medications being concerned uh, in use for the COVID-19 patient and uh, pulmonologist intensivist as well, since they're likely managing those patients or will be managing those patients with this com combined transplant in a COVID-19 patient. Additional problems to consider, though, is limited ability to procure donor organs due to inactive transplant networks, difficulty excluding the COVID-19 in the cadaveric donors. Living donor transplant, which I understand is the primary, if not the only, method used in Egypt, uh, gives you ex increased problems to consider, particularly the increased risk to the recipient having to come into the hospital to donate and then be in the ICU and hospitalized at least briefly post-surgery, assuming all goes well. 
All of this is resource dedicated COVID facility practice in region specific that must be considered, uh, particularly the ethics of adding this increased risk to the donor. Finally, bridging therapy should be offered to mitigate progression and allow for transplantation deferral, while COVID-19 hopefully improves or clears. So specific transplant issues. This again is one that the answer is all of the above. And I won't ask you to, to go through the questioning on this because that'll take a while now, particularly with the problems going back and forth. But this summary, transplant cannot be deferred, select patients with lower risk profile, decreased ability to procure donor organs, increased risk to living related donors, availability of a clean operating theater and a non-COVID ICU. All of those are important in the consideration of transplant. I'll make a note that there, I, came, I was able to find two cases of successful liver transplant having been reported in COVID-19 infected ACC patients. Please remove that slide. These were, however, complications in both of these patients with severe infections with prolonged hospitalizations occurring due to increased immunosuppression during rejection episodes. However, they did both survive and get out of the hospital, and their early reports were that they were doing well post-discharge, but these were very difficult, prolonged cases. Thus, as already mentioned, and I put all this in bold, it's generally recommended to transplant, if at all possible, to defer transplant, if at all possible. I'm sorry that's hidden by the panel on the right there. I hope you don't have that panel up there. While aggressively treating the COVID-19 infection and allowing it to remove, resolve or improve first. So one, this is a series of questions that's asking which recommendation is incorrect. And I think it's obvious from the discussion already C is the incorrect answer where it says no need for bridging therapy while awaiting clearance. And I'm going to skip ahead because this is taking too long with the problems we've had. So what are the specific interventions? Ablation using radio frequency, microwave, and I make a point of percutaneous ethanol injection. I'll come back to that later for areas with limited resources. Important use is bridging or even curative therapy in appropriate lesions, less than two centimeters. However, availability of anesthesia, potential operating theater, et cetera, required. Patient selection is vital. Again, single tumors less than three centimeters, few comorbidities to avoid excess COVID morbidity and mortality, and then ethical considerations of increased risk to the donor in living transplantation due to the risk of COVID-19 while hospitalized. Case and tear require availability of bed capacity. And again, the same things already listed. Alcohol injection is an accept acceptable substitute while awaiting clearance of COVID-19 in locations with limited resources. And I have a reference on that in my references. Conventional taste should be noted that it carries, that's the taste with chemotherapy, carries increased risk of greater COVID mortality and morbidity because of greater exposure systemically uh, to chemotherapy that escapes from the injection. Thus, the Deb case or the Dr. Rubison, uh, the spheres, uh, has been advised because of less immunosuppression. However, it may not be quite as effective because it doesn't get all the way into the fine areas of the tumor, but it causes less systemic problems of immunosuppression. Well, careful selection of patients is critical. So, true or false? Case carries greater risk of COVID-19 comorbidity due to the greater immunosuppression in transplant patients. And you can answer that one very quickly, I hope. Yeah, 82% got that right. Very good. Turn my hair while I close this. Okay, can you put it back to my control again, please? I can't move it forward. I have closed it now, dear doctor.
Yeah, it's not going. Okay, we're just about done. Discussion of systemic therapy. Patients who are already on existing therapies, such as one maybe already, already transplanted for HCC and has a recurrence or other problems, they have a greater risk of severe uh, complications given immunosuppression potential and must be advised so as to mitigate infection risk. Outpatient visits on follow-up transplant patients should be minimized Extended prescriptions provided so that they don't have to come back in for prescriptions and monitoring continued outside the medical center so as to limit visits to the clinic. Follow-up imaging should be deferred, especially if it's a capacity limited situation in your setting. Current data on effects of immune checkpoint inhibitors and their impact on COVID-19 are very limited. And treatment trials, if someone's already on a treatment trial, then they should be allowed to continue with uh, careful risk mitigation in terms of follow-up schedules, but it's not recommended that new patients be added to the uh, treatment trial. And I'm gonna just report on this one in the next slide, so it should be fairly clear what the recommendations are here. Uh, the key one is that the recommendation is going to be for checkpoint inhibitors, and I'll explain that. So, new patients, treatment option, best selected performance status assessment. New patients, oral therapies such as serafinib and levantinib prevent the need for visits for IV infusions as with checkpoint inhibitors like nev nivolumab, and thus are preferred so as to limit, again, the need for visits back to the clinic and to the hospital and the exposure both of the patient to other risks and of those in the hospital uh, to risk since they are COVID-19 positive. Monitoring blood work can be done remotely from the treatment center, so it's not, you don't have to come in for measures. Promising early results have been reported already, as mentioned, uh, but from remdesivir to increase the rate of recovery, but it's important to note that there's no proof at the moment of overall decrease in morbidity and mortality and it's not been tested in immune suppressed patients, so you need to stay on top of that very carefully. And uh, I'm going to put a little stronger uh, comment on chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine plus minus azithromycin. Uh, limited controlled trials have shown increased mortality in those on either experimental therapy, which is placebo, and have not shown any improvement in survival. In fact, with the increased mortality, their survival was worse. So at the moment, they are clearly not recommended outside of a controlled trial. Final takeaway point, COVID-19 infection changes everything, as we all know, and it's gonna be that way for some time. So all decisions on our HCC and transplant patients must take presence of COVID-19 and the ongoing risk of COVID-19 into full consideration. And there's the references, and that's Herky the Hawk from the University of Iowa. And I thank you for your patience. So um, what I'll be speaking, um, here's my conflict of interest disclosure. What I, what I thought I would do today is uh, quickly review um, the management of varices uh, according to the uh, AASLD uh, guidance um, uh, pre-COVID. And then I wanna stop and reflect how COVID-19 has, has changed everything. And, and to do that, I'm going to uh, compare what's happening in Canada, um, and specifically in my province, Alberta, where I live, um, to what happened in Italy, uh, and is continuing to happen in Italy, uh, because um, uh, Italy was a few weeks ahead of uh, our infections in Canada, and we were uh, preparing for a similar situation. And, and to what also is uh, going on uh, with regards to the pandemic in Egypt, I want to describe the occupational exposure to healthcare workers, and this is important when we're considering endoscopy, and it's something I think all of us as uh, physicians worry about. Uh, I'll review the specific recommendations for uh, PPE during endoscopy, and 
because of the limitations that were placed on us with our access to endoscopy in Alberta, I want to provide our approach uh, to varices during the pandemic. So uh, first, it, here's a little cartoon about the, the portal circulation and, and by far the most common reason for portal hypertension we see in North America is cirrhosis. Um, I want to point out that uh, a key feature of this in the laboratory evaluation of patients is the splenic sequestration that happens in the decreased platelet count. But recommendations in general are that patients that have evidence of uh, cirrhosis uh, should undergo a screening endoscopy uh, where we will put in a scope down there to see if there's and then we grade them as being small or large and that helps uh, decide whether or not we need to provide therapy. So a very important point is the, the liver function and according to the child pew classification uh, tells us how likely we are to encounter varices uh, when we perform an endoscopy. Uh, and, and surveillance screening, uh, surveillance in, in patients with child PUA cirrhosis can be further improved uh, if we use the Bovino criteria, if we have access to transient elastography uh, with the fibro scan um, and the Bovino 6 criteria used a cutoff of 20 kilopascals. And if the platelet count was also in addition higher than 150, your chance of having uh, esophageal varices was very low. And now that's been expanded in the Bovino uh, 6 criteria to a fiber scan less than 25 and platelets greater than 110. Can I get everybody else to mute their microphone who isn't speaking, please? Um, just a reminder about the growth of, growth of varices, um, you know, going from no varices to small varices, that happens at a rate of about 7 to 8% per year. And from small varices to large varices, which have the higher risk of bleeding, goes uh, again at about a, a 7 uh, to 8 percent uh, uh, per year. And what is the risk of first bleeding? If you have no varices, obviously it's quite low over the next five years. Uh, small varices uh, do have a risk of uh, bleeding uh, of about 3 to 5 percent per year, but the real risk is in the, in the large varices at 15 percent per year. So to summarize this part of the, the talk, uh, our risks, uh, which we're really worried about trying to prevent uh, 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 bleeding uh, and our risk for bleeding are really, are the varices large compared to small? Uh, do they have red markings, which we can only see at endoscopy? Uh, and how decompensated is the patient? Are they a child QB or C class uh, versus those with child QA who have a lower risk of bleeding? So I'm going to pose a question here to uh, the audience. I'd like uh, everyone please to vote. What is your preferred beta blocker if you're using a beta blocker to prevent variceal bleeding? All right, if we could get the poll results. A lot of people are, are selecting propanolol and, and carvedilol. Uh, in Canada, um, we tend to use more natalol than uh, propanolol just because of the once a day dosing. Um, but that's uh, very interesting to see the answers to that. So just a word about non-selective beta blockers. Uh, I was glad to see that nobody uh, selected um, metoprolol. Uh, that is a cardio-selective beta blocker. It's very important uh, to use a non-selective beta blocker uh, like uh, natalol or propanolol. And carvedilol uh, uh, has the added advantage of, of having the, the, uh, the, the blockade on the beta 2, so decreasing uh, blood flow into the splanchnic circulation, but also alpha blocking properties uh, within the liver, within the sinusoids, which also uh, lower uh, portal pressure in that way. So I'm, I'm not going to show a lot of studies, but I want to summarize, and this is again in the guidance paper uh, from the ASLD. For primary prophylaxis, that is a patient has not had a previous history of bleeding, um, meta-analysis show that non-selective beta blockers and banding are equally effective in, uh, in preventing the first bleed. If somebody has already bled and you treat that with banding, following that it's been shown that the combination of beta blockers and ongoing banding uh, is important for preventing the second bleed. So, just want to understand the audience again. Um, so uh, 
in a patient who has not bled yet and you do identify uh, varices, what is your preferred uh, strategy? Is it using a banding or is it using beta blockers? Please vote now. Could show the results, please. Interesting. Uh, I think if I would show this in my country, <laughs> most gastroenterologists would, would uh, 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 select uh, banding. So I, I'm pleased to see that. So we created this one, one page infographic uh, uh, based on the 2017 uh, ASLD guidelines. And this is in every endoscopy suite uh, in our city. Uh, and it summarizes a lot of information uh, on the guidelines. So for compensated uh, cirrhotics, using the FibroScan and the platelets to decide uh, in who a endoscopy can be deferred, uh, if uh, uh, patients meet those criteria uh, at the scope, uh, if there's uh, no varices and no active disease, no active alcohol, no active viral hepatitis, uh, when you recall the patient, if they have small varices with red marks, uh, selecting a non-selective beta blocker. If not, uh, bring them back for a scope in one to two years. And then if they're large uh, uh, or they have the red marks, um, then you can select either the non-selective beta blocker uh, or banding. However, uh, if the patient is decompensated, we tend in that situation, um, uh, if the patient is not bled, uh, our preference in our own unit is to use banding more so than uh, beta blockers, trying to avoid beta blockers. Uh, uh, in patients with refractory ascites, especially uh, for fear of uh, lowering the blood pressure. And then there's recommendations on the right side of the screen here as to what to do when they present uh, with a variceal bleed, understanding again that it's important uh, to use the combination uh, when um, uh, you're preventing the second bleed. All right, now I'll quickly uh, change our attention to COVID-19. And this is what's happening in Canada as of May the 14th. We have uh, uh, 73,000 cases, uh, 5,500 deaths in our country. Uh, it has been most hard hit in Quebec, followed by Ontario. And um, I work here in, in Alberta where there's uh, 6,400 cases, uh, of which 4,000 of those are in the city that I work in, in Calgary. So just to share a little bit about Alberta size compared to Italy and, and compared to Egypt, um, you know, so Alberta is actually twice as big as, e or as Italy and, and uh, Egypt's about 50% uh, larger than Alberta, but we have much different populations. Uh, Alberta, uh, four, four million people, Italy, 60 million people, and Egypt, almost 100 million people. And if you look at the deaths, and we were very worried that we were going to experience something like uh, what was happening in Italy, uh, where they had a large number of infections, including amongst healthcare workers, a large number of deaths, but we have not seen that in Alberta, uh, fortunately. So I want to ask uh, what you think is your risk going forward of contracting COVID-19 from occupational exposure? I'm very interested to see the polling results here. So most people uh, believe that their risk of uh, obtaining COVID-19 over the upcoming months um, through occupational exposure working in the hospital uh, is somewhere in the 10 to 25% range. So, um, in Alberta, we have a single um, payer healthcare system uh, as a publicly funded uh, healthcare system across the country. And, and all healthcare uh, provided in, in the acute care setting, including outpatient endoscopy, is, is uh, under the guidance of Alberta Health Services. And we have a scientific advisory group uh, that produces rapid reviews. And, and they recently uh, looked at this issue about what is the risk to healthcare workers. Um, and they summarized uh, data from around the world, including uh, Italy, uh, Hubei, China, where Wuhan is uh, high risk, and Spain. Uh, and they showed in these high risk countries that the overall risk for healthcare workers was around 3% compared to 0.3%, so a, ten a tenfold increase uh, compared to the general population. 
in low risk areas, uh, it was, you know, the risk of getting it for healthcare workers was much lower, uh, but still higher than that uh, by a factor of 10 compared to the general population. And in Alberta, where we work, uh, again, very low numbers uh, estimated on our experience so far um, and much closer to the general population risk. And when they broke this down to employees of our healthcare system who were non-physicians and physicians, they found uh, that, uh, first I'll point out that Alberta has the highest testing percentage of any jurisdiction in the world. Uh, we're doing uh, uh, about 5,000 tests a day on a population of 4 million people. Uh, so we have tested a lot of healthcare workers, um, not all of them, but 15%, uh, and less than 1% have returned positive and when these cases have been carefully looked at, uh, most of the cases occurred in the community and not through occupational risk. And in fact, when you looked at physicians, uh, uh, almost all of the cases occurred in the community, in including 20 cases that were linked to a single outbreak in a curling bond spiel. And this is how I became infected with COVID-19 in early March. Uh, curling's a winter sport that we play in Canada. Doctors are no different. Uh, and myself and uh, 73 uh, colleagues from around the country who participated in this sporting event, uh, three quarters of us uh, contracted COVID-19. So just a little word about uh, personal protective equipment. Um, here's a nice uh, online course that we offer through uh, my Office of Continuing, professional, uh, ed, um, um, Continuing Medical Education and Professional Development. Uh, and, it, and it shows how to properly put on PPE and take it off the donning and the doffing is very, very important. It's a free course, uh, it takes about an hour to complete. And there's been recommendations from the major gastroenterology and liver societies, including the Canadian Association of Gastroenterology that we should wear N95 masks, uh, protective eyewear or face shield, uh, head covering, waterproof ground, double gloves if possible, negative pressure rooms. But these are not actually available in, in many places. Uh, and again, it, our uh, Infection Prevention and Control Committee looked at the evidence very carefully uh, and felt that gastroscopy and colonoscopy really didn't meet the criteria for aerosol generating medical procedures. So the recommendation was that uh, we should save our PPE for those on the front lines in the emergency room in, the, in working in the intensive care unit and that we should just wear a surgical mask with uh, protective eyewear. Uh, the, the exceptions to this were when a patient's intubated or unstable and you think you're going to intubate them, there's, there's a risk of aerosol generation uh, happening there. Um, or, uh, and so there were specific uh, guidance given in that area. Now experience from Italy has suggested that uh, two case series, uh, one uh, looking at 851 patients that they called two weeks after having their endoscopy, they had a very high response rate. They only had one patient test positive for COVID-19. A further seven cases had uh, fever and cough. Three of them tested negative. And another experience uh, amongst healthcare workers from 41 hospitals in Northern Italy showed that 4.3% uh, uh, of the staff turned uh, uh, positive. Only half of, or half of those cases were isolated to three specific centers out of the 42, so little clusters of outbreaks. And, and the majority of those happened before uh, PPE uh, precautions were put in place. So the conclusion of this paper published in GUT is that the data suggests GI endoscopy is relatively safe both for the patients and the medical personnel. So in Alberta, we really shut down uh, in, uh, uh, very early on. Uh, and this is our, um, our chief medical officer of health who gives a daily update, trying to flatten the curve. They had everybody stay at home. And the other thing that we tried to do was increase capacity within our healthcare system, thinking that we were going to face a surge like Italy. Um, and so um, early in March, March the 18th, we canceled all elective surgeries and procedures in our acute care hospitals. Uh, and by the end of March, we had no ambulatory care happening uh, with face-to-face -face visits. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we built, uh, you know, added on to hospitals, uh, tent structures, and this is just an example of one of our hospitals in Calgary, uh, where we're thinking this would be a medical ward for COVID patients or for uh, uh, possibly even an, an ICU. 
And early on in March, as we were shutting down our healthcare system, we realized that we had to rethink how we manage Pharisees. So we came up with this new algorithm for this, which we recently published in the Canadian uh, Liver Journal. And so as has been mentioned by the guidelines, we said that we should defer screening endoscopy, but we had no idea how long this pandemic was gonna go on for. So we went further than that and we started thinking, should we be using beta blockers more uh, and endoscopy less? So definitely for the, the patients that were well compensated, uh, a new diagnosis, we can defer the screening endoscopy. If they have evidence of portal hypertension with a low platelet count, we could have a discussion with the patient about starting a beta blocker uh, uh, in that situation. If they're decompensated, where they have a high chance of having varices anyway on the endoscopy, we suggest talking to the patient about starting a beta blocker and only if they're intolerant going on to endoscopy. If patient is a known, uh, has known portal hypertension and varices and has had previous banding, if they've never bled and that banding is being done for prophylaxis, we would suggest switching to a non-selective beta blocker while endoscopy is limited and only returning to endoscopy uh, if the patient is intolerated. And of course, in patients who have recently bled, it's very important to continue with secondary prophylaxis. And this is the one category where we are allowed to continue endoscopy uh, throughout the last several weeks. So fortunately, the peak didn't come like it did in Italy. Uh, and to date, uh, um, as of May the 12th, we, um, we've had 6,300 cases in Alberta, but very few patients have actually been hospitalized or put in ICU. Uh, and that uh, has allowed us to now rethink about reopening some of our ambulatory care. So our curve is gonna be much flatter. It's gonna be bumpy. We've had major outbreaks amongst meat packing plants uh, in some of our communities, but uh, we've just launched a reopen strategy and just this week, we are having a phased relaunch of opening ambulatory care services, including endoscopy. So now we're, we're starting to rephase in uh, the, the, the number two on this list. And eventually as we reopen safely and we can show that this can be done safely, we'll start screening endoscopies again. So to conclude, COVID-19 um, does have a risk to healthcare workers, but it's low. Uh, and our patients that we're bringing to endoscopy is low if proper PPE precautions are taken. Most importantly, though, is how you put on that mask, protective eyewear, headwear, and gown, and gloves, and how you take it off. The doffing procedure to take it off properly involves you washing your hands three times between each and every step. And please check out that video if you'd like more information. Elective endoscopy may need to be minimized during COVID-19 outbreaks to increase the capacity of healthcare workers, including many of us like myself, thought we would be redeployed to work on general medicine units or in the intensive care unit, but that didn't happen. Uh, and while that is happening, consider the use of non-selective beta blockers uh, until our endoscopy utilization returns to normal. Thank you for your attention. And in fact, it's better to use heparin because we can control it and know how to use it more accurately than to use the anti-active factor five. So I prefer to use heparin because we have more experience with it other than the other factors. Okay, Professor Ganel, uh, this is the second yes. question for you yes. also. Um, it's since ACE2 are mostly abundant in cholangiocytes, how can we explain elevation of GGT while alkaline phosphate does not rise? This is from Professor Sharif Mugawar. Yes, thank you, Professor Sharif Mugawar. In fact, as we, you know that most of the things we don't know exactly what happened till now. But also, gamma GT is also raised if you have toxic uh, hepatic effect of the drug used to treat COVID-19. But all of us know also that there is affection of the cholangiocytes during this infection. And as you said, uh, gamma GT is elevated more than the alkaline phosphatase. Thank you very much.
Okay, the next question also for you, Professor Gamal. What is the best radiologic modality for COVID-19 from Professor Murtada Shabrao? Yes, um, uh, of course, it is the, the, the most important thing for us is the uh, uh, chest CT, because it's very important to us to see the effect of the infection on the lung, which is the major problem. And the CT chest have a very characteristic uh, picture in COVID-19 infection. Okay, thank you very much. The next question is, uh, if there is any recommendations to start a trial using Sophos Biver as prophylactic for healthcare teams, and it's a repeated question. Uh, in fact, not yet, there is no study done till now, but we are preparing a protocol for this to use Sophos Biver as a prophylaxis, but till now, I didn't hear about any trial even in the uh, uh, abroad, talking about the use of the direct antiviral agents as a prophylaxis for healthcare workers. But my suggestion is that using the hydroxychloroquine has a side effects more, and maybe we can combine between uh, erythromycin and uh, sofosbuvir as a prophylaxis for healthcare workers, and those who are also uh, relatives of infected persons. Mm -hmm. Can I comment on that as well, please? Yes. Yeah, so... Yes, of course. As, yeah, as, as I was showing in, in the presentation, I, I think, you know, I hope my, my point was made that the risk to healthcare workers uh, seems to be small if, if proper PPE is, is taken, uh, yes. precautions are taken. Um, we have a... Um, we have some prophylaxis uh, uh, trials uh, ongoing in Canada uh, with regards to hydroxychloroquine. Um, none, um, none, none so far with uh, any of the anti other antiviral uh, agents, but clinical trials are underway. Yes. Thank you, Vera. Thank you, professors. The next question is why not to treat HCV in patients with COVID-19 by Sophos Biver, which can affect um, activity of COVID-19. I think it's... Uh... No, no, we are, we are not saying that it will affect the activity of COVID, but here we are saying that we have to concentrate more in treating of patients with COVID-19 and the treatment of HCV can be postponed. So mm -hmm. it is not a matter of that we are afraid from the antiviral drug, but here we have to concentrate more in treatment of COVID-19. It is not time to look for the HCV and treatment of HCV, especially if we are talking about the patients with decompensated cirrhosis. So the yeah. priority is for COVID-19. Okay. The, the other consideration there, and, and we made a, um, a, a re recommendation to do the exact same thing, um, was that we needed our laboratories to focus not on running uh, HBV DNA tests, not on running HCV RNA tests, um, uh, but to focus on uh, RT-PCR and, and all the uh, materials that are required for that uh, for testing COVID-19. So all of our attention was uh, put on COVID-19 testing. And that, that, I, that, that was very, that's going to be very important in controlling, um, you know, uh, outbreaks and, and is testing the population. Yeah, I, I, I'll just add a comment also, if I may. That, uh, you know, marshalling the resources one has. There are lots of things we'd all like to do, but in general, we can't do everything. And so, as Kelly has suggested, focusing on what's most critical at the moment is what we need to do and continue trying to keep our regular care up for the patients as well. Thanks, professors. Next question is, uh, what's the role of anticoagulants, again, in case of cirrhosis with COVID-19, in spite of low prothrombin activity and thrombocytopenia? And why not to treat HCV patients in COVID-19 with sophos -Bivir? Okay, it's a repeated question then. Um, I think it's for the same protein for replication. 
Of course, all of us know that the coagulopathy in patients with liver cirrhosis is to some extent a problematic issue. And here we are not talking about the thrombocytopenia or low prothrombin activity, but the anticoagulant is very important for us in patients with COVID to prevent coagulopathy of the and coagulation, especially on the vessels of the respiratory tract. Mm -hmm. Oh, using heparin as well, um, uh, Professor Gamal. Yes. I even in the presence of thrombocytopenia. Yes. Okay. Do you want to comment, um, Ahmed or uh, Professor Kelly or Professor Doc? Um, yeah, I mean, we um, we uh, looked at this uh, very carefully. Um, you know, there, there's clearly thromb thrombotic risk associated with the critically ill. Uh, a patient with COVID-19, we, we know that our uh, cirrhotic patients are al already hypercoagulable, so it, it is something that uh, you need to pay attention to. Um, and um, uh, early anticoagulation uh, should be a consideration of hospitalized, pa hosp hospitalized patients uh, with, with heparin, as you were saying. Yes, thank you. Thanks, professors. Um, the next question for Professor Douglas. Uh, what's ETOH as cause of HCC in Egypt? Thank you. Uh, ETOH, of course, is alcohol, the standard abbreviation for it. I apologize for not spelling it out. And my understanding from my reading to try and get a better understanding of HCC in Egypt was that it's an increasing cause of liver disease in Egypt. In general, in the past, because of taboos on drinking alcohol, it was not that big a problem, but it appears from what I've been able to read in papers coming out of Egypt that alcohol is becoming an increasing cause of liver disease. And as it causes more liver disease and cirrhosis, it will start to cause more HCC. Just one to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, question number eight for Professor Douglas. Is it recorded that acute liver failure is recorded in COVID-19 patients? To my knowledge, I think there's been one reported case of acute liver failure in a COVID-19 patient presenting, uh, but there's very little data on that. Uh, Kelly? Yeah, I'm not, I, I that one case report that was uh, presented there uh, was uh, uh, of interest to in me, and I, I will I will seek that out and and look for it. I, I'm not I'm not aware of uh, uh, of anything outside of that. I think it's it's uh, likely a, a rare occurrence. Certainly, uh, a very high elevated liver enzymes are are, are recorded in uh, patients that are um, uh, sick with COVID nineteen, uh, but that's uh, you know multifactorial in origin likely. Yeah, and I, I think in a patient, a patient with COVID-19 presenting with a severely elevated liver enzymes, the first thing to do is to look for another cause that was not previously diagnosed. Yes, there is some cases reported from China about the uh, occurrence of acute liver failure due to co-infection with HE virus, hepatitis E virus. So also, as you said, this is another cause, not a direct cause of uh, COVID-19. Okay, thank you, professors. The next question, can COVID-19 decrease patients to be organ donors? Uh, at the moment, I wonder what your plans in Egypt are or what Kelly's plans in Canada are, but a patient, certainly a patient with active COVID-19 would not be considered as a donor. And I don't believe that one would be considered for a patient, quote unquote, recently recovered, since as we well know at this point, unfortunately, that the fact that a patient recovers and becomes negative doesn't mean that they aren't going to relapse. Uh, so I, I do not I believe... You're, I hope you're wrong, Doug. <laughs> That, I hope that you're wrong as somebody that's had COVID-19, but uh, uh, yeah, you're right. I think we, we don't know that for sure. Well, I um, hope you never be a, have to be a donor either. Yeah. <laughs> so I can tell you what happened in Canada. Um, 
uh, again, in preparation for the surge that we were anticipating, uh, we realized that there would be a, an impact on organ donation. Um, and many centers in, in Canada, including uh, ours in Alberta, which is in Edmonton, and Toronto, which is um, the largest live, one of the largest live donor liver transplant programs uh, in the world, um, uh, did temporarily put their uh, programs on hold. Um, that was more around fear of, you know, the, the donor coming to the acute care um, hospital setting and, and perhaps, you know, catching COVID-19 in that setting. The issue around deceased donation, we were very worried that our ICUs would be overwhelmed uh, and therefore we wouldn't have um, the ability to, to work up um, um, a, a donation after brain death or even donation after cardiac death. Um, so we were worried that uh, um, organ donation was gonna decrease. Um, fortunately, we haven't seen the same uh, situation that has happened, you know, in Italy or other jurisdictions like New York City. So, uh, you know, uh, we're again uh, considering now reopening uh, live donor um, liver transplant in, in, in Canada. Yeah, one last comment, kind of a historical interest, but I can tell you that in the U.S., it's been pulling teeth to try and get programs to agree to use hepatitis C positive organs in urgent cases where you're desperate for a, a liver to transplant, even though we now know that we can quite successfully treat those patients post-transplant. But organ, uh, you know, most programs in the U.S. have been very reluctant to go to using positive organs, even though there's good data out there showing that it's very successful. Yeah, we, we certainly are. And, you know, we're, we've, uh, reinfected people that we've previously treated with hepatitis C um, uh, while on the wait list by giving them a, a positive organ. Uh, we have used HCV positive organs in lung and um, uh, kidney transplant uh, recipients and, and have successfully treated them post-transplant. So, yeah. We still have a battle with the heart transplant group, but we finally got the kidney group to go along. The next question is, uh, are we expecting a legislation reg regulating the use of telemedicine in communicating with our patients? Professor Douglas. Mm -hmm. Well, in the United States, there's very active work uh, to get legislation to approve payment for telemedicine and communicating with our patients. That's an ongoing area that was growing before COVID-19 and has received very major uh, impetus with the onset of COVID-19 and the desire to interact with patients at a distance. So I don't know what to expect in other countries. I don't know what's happening in Canada, but I imagine you're doing a lot of telemedicine with these patients as well. Yeah, I, I've, in the last month, uh, that's all I've been uh, doing in the, since I've come back uh, from my infection. And, and uh, um, we're, we're, uh, we have been given additional billing codes again we you know we have a single payer system so our government uh, decides what doctors get paid for different services and um, they, they did bring in special codes which will be in effect until September we don't know what will happen after that where we are getting essentially the same uh, as specialists we're getting the, the same amount of money for seeing somebody virtually as, as we would in person um, uh, uh, family doctors um, get paid much less for that. Um, so they're, they are working on that. Um, they allowed us, our regulators allowed us to use platforms which um, probably wouldn't have met the highest uh, standards of security in HIPAA like Zoom, which we're using for this webinar. We, we're using it for patient, and there was a, a, a patient encounters in telemedicine. There was a lot of concerns around uh, the security of Zoom and Zoom bombings, and everybody heard about that early on in the experience, but Zoom is, is still one of the things that we are using for patient encounters. Um, so those were some important considerations in Canada. And I think this is gonna change us um, forever. Like Doug said, you know, telemedicine was slowly uh, being introduced. Um, I had not done participated in it at all previously, and patients now are gonna expect this. Um, so this 
this is going to change the way that we practice medicine going forward for years to come. Yeah, in, in the U.S., uh, until very recently, there were you know we're a multi-payer system, not just government payer system, and we didn't have any codes at all. And so people that started doing it, telemedicine had no way to charge for it at all. So they were very reluctant to do it. Patients have been very happy to start doing it, many of them. And they've taken to it quite readily. And at the university, until just last week, other than really emergent, urgent visits, all outpatient clinics were closed and everything was done by telemedicine. Mm -hmm. Okay, the last question so far is, can COVID-19 be presented with GIT disturbances only? Professor Kelly. Yeah, it, it's very interesting. Um, uh, we, we, we looked specifically at our, at our outbreak, which was amongst 73 um, uh, uh, participants at that uh, sporting event, and uh, we carefully tracked everybody's symptoms uh, Seventy-five percent of them were physicians, so I hope they're good historians. But we we carefully tracked all of those, and and it's uh, these atypical presentations of COVID nineteen uh, uh, are uh, recognized. Um, di diarrhea, uh, nausea, uh, dyspepsia, uh, other GI symptoms were seen in seventy percent of our uh, in in our experience. Um, not as the only presentation though. Uh, purely a gastrointestinal presentation alone I think is uncommon. Um, the anosmia, loss of smell and, and taste uh, was seen in 75% of our participants. Um, so uh, you have to pay attention to the atypical presentations. Um, only 50% uh, of our participants had fever, 80% um, had cough, 40% um, had shortness of breath at some point during their illness. Uh, and it's very interesting that the, the diarrhea occurred in, in, in two places. It occurred early in the symptoms uh, and it occurred uh, later. I personally had it around day seven. Uh, and there's this phenomenon of, of a cytokine storm happening later in the course of the illness where hospitalized patients typically can deteriorate uh, around day seven. Uh, and uh, mine started with diarrhea that evening um, and uh, the following morning, I had severe myalgias, uh, flu-like illnesses that landed in me, me in bed for two days. So yes, uh, pay attention to gastrointestinal disturbances for sure. Yeah, two, two additional minor quick comments on that. The very first, if you will, patient zero identified in the U.S. in the state of Washington in that nursing home, he presented to the emergency room with abdominal pain and diarrhea. Uh, he had no pulmonary symptoms or fever at the time of presentation. That was figured out once he was in the hospital a few days. The second one is that there are a number of studies now that have shown not only is it in the GI tract and it binds to uh, receptors in the intestine as well, but that many patients, given all the interest in clearing patients and saying you're negative, you can go back to work, you can do this, you can do that, nobody has to worry about you anymore. Many of them are still spilling the virus in their stool for days to weeks after the standard swabs, et cetera, have turned negative. So it's another thing that's not been monitored carefully in the decisions when people are safe, if you will. So yeah, I mean, yeah we, had, we had that experience as well. And, and uh, you know, n nobody in our outbreak was, was hospitalized. One, one physician went to the emergency room, but fortunately wasn't hospitalized. So a lot of us by, you know, day 10, our symptoms had recovered and we were keen to get back to work. Um, at the time, you know, this was very early in the declaration of the pandemic and uh, our workplace health and safety said that we had to have two negative nasal swabs uh, uh, two days apart uh, to get back to work. But it was clear that some people are shedding virus. It's not clear that it's a, a viable virus. Um, uh, so we just, uh, the policy actually changed Partly based on on our own experience, that you know, had to be sim you had the healthcare workers had to stay home for 14 days, uh, or until the end of their symptoms, realizing that some things like fatigue and a post viral cough or the loss of smell um, may not recover right away and doesn't necessarily mean that you're still infectious. 
there's so much we still don't know about the virus. So one has to keep on top of the latest news. <laughs>